Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, John J. DeJoya, President, Georgetown University. Well, good afternoon, everyone. As our semester comes to a close, I wish to thank all of you for being here today. We're especially grateful to Rena Agarwal, the director of our Center for Financial Markets and Policy at our McDonough School of Business and vice provost for faculty. Since its founding in 2010, the center has served as a forum for regulators, policymakers, and industry leaders to come together to engage in rigorous debate, discussion, and research to guide policy and practice. So I want to thank you to all of our colleagues at the center who have helped to make this special gathering possible. We come together today in Gaston Hall. Throughout our history, this hall has served as one of the most important places for public discourse and discussion here in Washington. And today's gathering with distinguished national leaders reflects the commitment we have as an academic community located in our nation's capital to engage in a national dialogue on the issues facing our country. Last month, in a message to our community, I reaffirmed our responsibility to bring the resources of our university into engagement with the challenges in our nation. And one of the ways in which we realize this commitment is through fostering and promoting the debate and dialogue that takes place on this hilltop. Today, we are honored to welcome two individuals who have played an important role in shaping and directing economic policy for our country. Former Chairman of the Federal Reserve System and the Economic Recovery Advisory Board, Paul Volcker, and Vice President Joe Biden. Mr. Volcker and Vice President Biden have been longtime colleagues working in support of policies and leadership intended to promote the flourishing of our national economy and the financial stability of the United States by improving accountability and transparency in our financial system. We're honored to welcome Vice President Biden back to our hilltop, and we look forward to his reflections in just a few minutes on the importance of sound financial sector regulation. But first, I'd like to offer a few words about our distinguished guest who will introduce him, Mr. Paul Volcker. A graduate of Princeton and Harvard, Mr. Volcker began his career as an economist at the New York Federal Reserve Bank in 1952. Since that time, he has held numerous positions in both the public and private sectors, including Vice President and Director of Forward Planning at Chase Manhattan Bank, Under Secretary of the U.S. Treasury for Monetary Affairs, President of the New York Federal Reserve, and for two terms, Chairman of the Board of the Federal Reserve System. He's provided counsel and guidance to national and world organizations, chairing in 2004 the Independent Inquiry Committee into the UN Oil for Food Program, and in 2007 a World Bank panel reviewing the operations of the Department of Institutional Integrity. In 2008, President Obama asked him to lead the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. He has served on a number of distinguished advisory groups and boards, including his own nonpartisan nonprofit group, the Volcker Alliance, which he established to address the challenges of successful implementation of public policies and to help rebuild public trust in government. In 2007, he served as speaker and received an honorary degree here at the commencement ceremonies of our McDonough School of Business, and it's an honor to welcome him back to the hilltop to address our community again today. Please join me in welcoming Paul Volcker. Thank you very much, President DeJoya, students, staff, others who might be here. You know, introducing Vice President Biden on this special occasion is a really great privilege for me. I think I ought to begin with a revealing anecdote. 
One day, if I recall correctly, in November 2009, sitting quietly up in New York, I got an unanticipated telephone call. Vice President Biden was on the line. That was an one and only time for me. He asked directly whether my idea that commercial banks protected by the U.S. government shouldn't be involved in speculative trading was catching on. I said it was a really good idea, but I had no horses to sell it. The Vice President immediately responded, don't worry about that, I'll be your horse. That he was. He took on the skeptics in and out of the administration. He gave the proposal political weight. President Obama soon announced his support. And to my complete surprise, labeled the new law the Volcker Rule. So it could well have been labeled the Biden Rule. Then nobody would have had the nerve to question it today. Well, now we're approaching an unexpected new administration. It brings a whole range of unanswered questions, as you well know, not least about financial reform. No doubt there are those who would like to see large parts of the financial reform set out in the Dodd-Frank Act put aside. They're seemingly oblivious to the lessons of the near breakdown of the financial system in 2008. Now, we escaped a Great Depression, but it took an enormous intervention of government funds to protect the banks and the economy from that threat. We don't want to repeat that experience again. Now, there's been a lot of comment and concern, I know, about the relatively slow recovery from the so-called Great Recession. In my view, not enough attention has been paid to the simple fact that we have, in fact, reached close to full employment. Our performance here in the United States stands out particularly in contrast to the rest of the industrialized world. And to my mind, it's very important we have reached a point We've reached that point of full employment consistent with reasonable price stability and the prospect we can maintain that in the months and years ahead. Now I realize there are large questions about the future. The period of expansion has been long by historic standards. Productivity growth as measured for two decades has been below earlier experience. You know, I say as measured in that sentence because I suspect it's hard for the statisticians, much as they try to keep up with the cyber economy and measure its output, the result may be lower statistics than the real economy justifies. But I'm not here as a prognosticator, but for sure we are on sounder economic footing than when President Obama and Vice President Biden took office. So I greatly appreciate the opportunity not to introduce Joe Biden, who knew, needs no introduction from me, but to thank the man. He's given his professional life to public service and his personal life to a strong family. Each has had its share of satisfaction and joy, but tragedy as well. I trust Vice President Biden that as you leave office, you leave so with a sense of personal contribution and satisfaction that only a full life of family love and public service can provide. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the Vice President of the United States. Thank you. Please, thank you very, very, very much. Please, please be seated. Mr. Chairman, what a 
What a high honor and a wonderful compliment for you to introduce me and say the things you said. I hope as I, uh, as I leave this office, I hope my ability to stay engaged in the great affairs of the country is as uh, partially as meaningful as yours has been. You have never, ever stopped serving your country, and you have never, never been stopped, uh, stopped anyone from going to you and continue to ask for your advice and your input. You're one of the most respected economists in the country, and you're one of the most respected men in the country. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's good to be back up on the Hill. It's good to be back in Gadsden Hall. My, uh, my son, Hunter, as a matter of fact, uh, Five Bidens have graduated from, uh, from this great university. One of my three children, based on tuition, I think at least the sidewalk should be named after me or something. <laughs> but uh, one of my two sons, Hunter Biden, who is a brilliant young man, and, uh, um, and uh, two of my sister's children and two of my brother's children. And, uh, they all have — it's served them all incredibly well. I was thinking, uh, President DeJoya, that as I walked out, the first time I walked on this stage was back when Father O'Donovan was president. And he asked me to deliver the most difficult speech I've ever delivered in my life. I, no speech — I mean this sincerely — that I work harder on. My son joined the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, and there was a retreat filled as this hall is today. And I was asked by Father whether I would come and speak on how my, how my faith had informed my public policy. And I had spent most of my career, all of my career, making sure never to let the twain meet, to never talk about my faith as it related to public policy. It was personal. But I didn't know how to tell um, Father O'Donovan uh, no. And I worked very, very, very hard. I mean, I mean this sincerely. I spent hours and hours trying to figure out how could I, could I do this. And as we Catholics say, as the nuns used to say to us, as I examined my conscience, <laughs> um, uh, I realized that uh, the one thing that informed my public policy the most was my faith and all the great faiths, uh, abhorrence for the abuse of power. And uh, so the subject matter, it ended up being a, a significant moment for me in realizing all the things that have ever uh, uh, gained my, uh, my emotional commitment and my intellectual effort, all related to the abuse of power, from the time I got involved as a high school kid in the civil rights movement to the women's movement to the abuse of women and children, et cetera, as well as the abuse of uh, economic power. And in a strange sense, this is a little bit what I want to talk about today. Um, and uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you and the Volcker Alliance for organizing today's conference uh, on maintaining the financial stability of our economy. It seems like a no-brainer, obviously, the financial stability of our economy. The chairman released a paper today that is a blueprint on how to make our financial system safer especially mitigating the risk of short-term debt. And I think it's very, very uh, important reading for financial regulators, business leaders, reporters, academics, and students, for anyone concerned about the future of our economy. And from my perspective, it comes, I think, at a very pivotal moment. You know, we're in the midst of one of the longest economic recoveries in American history, as the chairman pointed out a moment ago. On almost every measure, Americans are better off today than they were eight years ago, but there's still a lot of people being left behind. But it wasn't an accident. It happened because uh, we made some very tough, very unpopular decisions that things turned out, turned out they turned out to be the right call on balance. And uh, one of the first people the president went to upon winning was, was uh, Chairman Volcker to lead a group of economists to give us the best advice we could, because 
you know, it's a recovery that requires us to remember just how far we've come and how we can't afford to go back to the policies that only brought down the entire economy just eight years ago. You know, that's, uh, and that's what I'd like to talk with you a few minutes about today. Eight years ago this month, President-elect Obama and I were forming an administration, and the financial system was crumbling, and the economy was on the brink of collapse. And we lived the pain, and we can't ever forget the turmoil. People were terrified of another Great Depression. Over 3 million foreclosures a year from 2009 to 2011. Bank runs, thought to be a thing of the past, were back. Remember that in 1930, fearful depositors, our grandparents, great-grandparents, withdrew their money from banks. But in this great recession, and I remember, and uh, Paul may remember, I got criticized for engaging in hyperbole when I named it the Great Recession. There goes Biden again, another Biden gaffe. <laughs> I wish it had been a gaffe. But it wasn't our grandparents. It was, it was, it was in fact, large institutions, not ordinary households were taking their funds back. Credit markets, credit markets uh, dried up, making it almost impossible for small businesses to keep their doors open and meet a payroll. Prospective homeowners uh, to get a mortgage, car buyers to get a loan, and, and right before election day, Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed, unleashing a real, actual fear that the whole financial system could come crashing down. It's hard to remember that right now, thank goodness. Across the country, people were rapidly losing confidence in the government's ability to stem panic and to stabilize the financial system. And we have to remember that the deal in the financial, financial sector led to a crippling conditions in the real economy, the real lives of millions of American households and businesses outside of Wall Street, off of Wall Street. This month, eight years ago, we had already lost 695,000 jobs, good middle-class jobs. And when Barack and I placed our hands on the Bible, as we were shorn in on January 20th, 2009, we'd already lost almost 700,000 at that moment and ended up losing more than 800,000 that month of January. Unemployment would peak at 10%. Long-term unemployment saw historic highs. Poverty rate exceeded 15 percent, the highest level in decades. And the stock market plummeted. It's hard to believe it now, but remember, we were worried, what was it going to fall below 6,000? That was a debate. Trillions of dollars in wealth lost. Decades of retirement savings destroyed overnight. I think we're still feeling the lingering effects of that in terms of how people conduct themselves. Falling real estate prices left nearly a third of the mortgaged homes underwater. Seven million homes lost to foreclosure since the start of the Great Recession. GM and Chrysler, iconic automobile industry of the United States, headed toward bankruptcy, risking livelihoods of 1.5 million workers up and down the auto supply chain. And uh, this economic crisis didn't happen by chance. The reason to remember how it happened is not to hold people responsible, particularly, is to make sure we don't commit the same problem, the same sin again. You know, it was a, a direct result of short-sighted, irresponsible, and I would argue, greedy actions by Wall Street and Washington's lacks of regulation over a, a 20 to 30-year period. And so Barack and I knew that fixing the real economy meant stabilizing and fixing the financial system. Mr. Chairman, I remember a conversation that one we had, but I also remember the meetings we had to figure out what to do and how we leaned on you. I remember the first meeting the president-elect and I had with our economic team in Chicago a month before the inauguration. We were told that tens of millions of Americans owed more in their homes than they were worth, and we were told that we might need well over a trillion dollars to fix the banks. The good news we were told, and I remember sitting in that room with about 40 economists. You weren't there. You were back in New York, I believe. I'm not sure where you were, but the, the, the economic team we had put together, advisory team, we were told that started off, and the good news in the opening comment was, Mr. President, we have good news. We're not going to recommend that you call a bank holiday. It's like, whoa, what do you mean? <laughs> 
you know, that's the good news. Look, I'm serious. Not a joke. And it was said in deadly earnest because there were considerations of whether or not they were going to recommend that we call a bank holiday. I'll never forget. That's what President Roosevelt was told during the Great Depression. We knew our regulatory system was outdated, designated decades ago, designed decades ago, and was ill-equipped to monitor, monitor the modern-day economy. And we had seen this uh, play out before in major economic crises driven by insufficient regulation. I was there in the United States Senate when we dealt with the savings and loan crisis in the 80s. I was there when we, uh, when we had to deal with the, the failure of long-term capital management in the 90s. And I was there in the aftermath of the Enron debacle in 2000, which reminds me of that old bad joke of Claude and Maud, they're in their late 90s sitting on the porch in their farm, and Claude looks at Maud and said, Maud, remember in WW1, I was gassed and I came home and you took care of me? And then Ma, she said, yeah. And she said, remember then in 1922, we went out and we bought that little drugstore. And, uh, you know, then in 29, we lost it all, collapsed, and you were there, Ma. And then he goes through all these things in life. And then and I got drafted in WW2, and I, 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 that's when I lost these two fingers on my hand, Ma. And he goes through it all, and he looks at it, and he said, Ma, I was thinking, you're bad luck. <laughs> um, well, maybe I'm bad luck because I went through all of those. But when it comes... Because I was there. <laughs> and when it comes to the Great Recession of 2008, we knew the specific underpinnings were complex, and, uh, but also that uh, we, could re we could avoid repeating it again. Banks and other financial companies that originated mortgages knew that they could turn around and sell these loans in a heartbeat. So they often threw lending standards out the window, making billions of dollars on loans who are completely unprepared to people who are completely un unprepared to make, make the payments. I remember a fellow who was a classmate of my son's uh, became a very successful real estate man. Uh, and, uh, and I remember him telling me, you know, I had a housekeeper came up to me and said, I'm, guess what? They're going to give me a $300,000 loan to buy a $300,000 home. He said, how can you pay it? She said, well, they told me I'd be able to. I'm not making that up. Ratings agencies were paid by banks and institutions to a great risk. Time and again, they uh, gave inflated ratings to these to get business. The repeal of Glass-Steagall allowed banks with deposits to take on risky investments, putting the whole system at risk. This was a debate inside the White House whether I should say this, but I'm, I've never not said what I believe. That was the worst vote I ever cast in my entire time in the United States Senate, repeal of Glass-Steagall. There was this SEC regulation in 2004 that allowed the biggest investment banks to operate with too much leverage, too much reliance on short-term debt, and very little supervision. Across the board, there was insufficient regulatory infrastructure. A shadow banking system was allowed to operate with limited oversight. The lack of a systematic regula re regulator overseeing the whole system. New and exotic financial products, widely misunderstood, were not subject to adequate regulation. The structure of executive pay created incentives for CEOs to take excessive risks. Collectively, this wasn't uh, about allowing banks to take on more risk. It was about shifting the risk from the banks to the government and the taxpayer. That's because the federal government lacked adequate authority to manage failures, and banks knew. They knew they had a backstop in the form of the American taxpayer. The administration and our, and our Democratic allies in Congress knew that we had to protect American families from immediate damage, but we also it was imperative to identify and curb the risks that were being taken so that we could help prevent future crises. President Bush, he saw the beginnings of the crisis and knew he needed to act, even though he had no way to know of its magnitude. So he started the Troubled Assets Relief Program, so-called TARP, which injected capital into the banking system and, in some cases, financed purchases of toxic assets from the banks. And before stimulus was a dirty word, President Bush pushed for modest rebate checks to taxpayers to try to stem the crisis and jolt the economy a little bit. And the President and I, President Obama and I, along with Republicans in the Congress, continued the TARP program 
to avoid a complete collapse of our financial system. Mr. Chairman, you know, but anyway, voting for TARP, bailing out banks, was like putting a snake in everyone's living room. I mean, talk about the most unpopular vote any member of Congress. I really mean this now. I'm serious. The folks who, quote, caused the crisis, all of a sudden, we're making sure that we bail them out. It's hard to explain to average, well-informed Americans. But it was necessary. It was the right vote, and it helped save the economy. When all was said and done, TARP amounted to over $400 billion. But because we insisted it be paid back with interest, the taxpayers got it all back, plus $15 billion in interest. We also rescued the auto industry, which was not at all popular among Democrats or Republicans, by the way. Six in 10 people didn't think we should do it. It was on the brink of bankruptcy. But today, and I know I got blamed for pushing that a lot, because I'm middle-class Joe, and I'm the guy who's a manufacturer. You know, well, I, <laughs> I understand, at universities in particular, Washington in very particular, to be middle-class means you're not sophisticated. But I understand when the middle class does well, everybody does well. The wealthy do very well, and the poor have a way up. And it's, the, it's what holds together the social contract, a growing middle class. But today, the automobile industry is back on its feet. 695,000 jobs added since the, autom the automakers emerged from bankruptcy, the fastest growth on record. And Dodd-Frank was the centerpiece of our plan to stabilize the financial system and prevent another crisis. With your help, Mr. Chairman, we implemented the Volcker Rule to uh, reinstill a firewall between risky bets and safe investments, disallowing banks from gambling with American bank deposits. The law created a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to do everything from helping students get the best deal on their loans to making sure debt collectors act within the law to cracking down on predator lenders uh, targeting military families. Pretty important stuff. It's now taken for granted again. But I don't know how many times my son, who was a decorated veteran of the Iraq War. He was a JAG officer, spent a year in Iraq. I remember how he, I, I had an opportunity to see him several times because I was responsible for Iraq, and I traveled in and out of Iraq a total of in Afghanistan 28 times. And the year he was there, I'd see him. He said, Dad, what I most get is soldiers, panic calls coming to see me. They're foreclosing on my house at home. They're foreclosing on my house. What do I do? Today, as a cop on the beat, the uh, CFPB has brought more than $11 billion in relief to 27 million Americans while protecting all consumers from harm harmful financial scams and practices. And Dodd-Frank also created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which for the first time looked at the financial system as a whole to see where the risk might arise. The goal of the council is to monitor when a failure by a single company could end up affecting people who have nothing to do with that particular firm or company. The law regulated derivatives, like credit default swaps, or bringing them into, ex into exchanges to increase transparency and brought oversight to the shadow banking system. It empowered the Fed, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, known as the FDIC, to do what it does best, empowering it to deal with bankrupt banks and permanently increased the amount of insured deposits from $100,000 to $250,000, giving people the peace of mind that their deposits are safe and preventing bank runs in the future. Required better capitalized banks, making them hold more capital to buffer against downturns and subjecting them to stress tests. Enforced conflicts of interest prohibitions with rating agencies to restore confidence that their evaluations are fair and unbiased. It put in place new regulations to change the culture of executive compensation, like say on pay, which allows shareholders to say whether executive pay raises are appropriate. Like, like clawbacks, the ability to back uh, clawback bonuses from underperforming executives. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but quite frankly, there's more that has to be done in reining in executive CEO pay. And this was all part of a nationwide effort to rid our financial system of the reckless behavior and fraud that nearly brought down the entire economy, not here, but worldwide. 
But let's be honest. There were, there were some, myself, the chairman, and several others, including the state's attorney generals, who didn't think we went far enough. <laughs> I remember my son calling me, he's the attorney general of the state of Delaware, Mr. Chairman, and saying, Dad, uh, I can't tell you what I'm about to do because it would be a conflict of interest, but uh, Dad, I just want to warn you, uh, the administration is not going to like it. Uh, I'm not going to settle with these banks. Kamala Harris of California, now Senator-elect. Catherine Cortez Mastow of Nevada. Senator-elect Roy Cooper of North Carolina, all elected, now elected. And I'm proud to say uh, the Attorney General of the State of Delaware, Bo Biden, went after the banks uh, for their role in the crisis, bringing in over $100 million back to Delaware and several billion to all three of those states. But none of this happened overnight. But the financial sector stabilized much more quickly than our critics thought it would allowing American commerce to get back on its feet. Let's remember what our Republican friends said at the time and continue to say about Dodd-Frank. Mitch McConnell, who's a friend, and he truly is a friend, John Boehner, who's a friend, Paul Ryan, who's a friend, the entire Republican caucus. Hell, I remember when the Republicans and the conservative media thought I was exaggerating, as I said, when I called it the Great Recession. The same people said Dodd-Frank would restrict credit markets. But today, credit markets are functioning again. Americans can get home, auto, student, and small business loans at reasonable rates. Congressman Henserling, chairman of the House Financial Services, said Dodd-Frank would crush small business lending. Today, small business lending is back to pre-recession levels and small business startups saw the largest year-over-year -year increase in the last two decades. So much for the disaster. He and so many other Republicans said it would crush community banks. Today, community banks are back lending at pre-recession levels and expanding significantly. And he and so many other Republicans said Dodd-Frank would make the banking sector riskier. But banks are better capitalized today with an additional $700 billion in capital to protect against downturns. The number of bank failures decreased from 140 in a year, the president and I took office, to eight last year. And the cost of failures of the federal insurance, insurance fell $38 billion to under $1 billion this period, a decline of 98 percent. And so much for the Republican Party orthodoxy that says Dodd-Frank would be a disaster for the real economy, as my friend John Maynard said. Here are the facts. I know a lot of people, and probably many of you do, maybe even some of your parents, who lost their jobs and have been hit hard. But today, we're in the midst of the longest streak of job growth in history, over 15 million jobs added, more than all the advanced economies in the world combined. And the unemployment rate is 4.6 percent. Well, at the time of the Great Recession, there were too many retirees who lost their savings or delayed retirement. Today, most retirement accounts have been restored. Americans added $34 trillion in wealth over the course of this administration. While we know not everyone got back their homes, not everyone that, that, that uh, which meant everything to them, housing prices are up by about a third, and 8 million homeowners are above, not underwater. But what we forget is those folks who lost their home, never having missed a mortgage payment, the lawn on either side of them having turned brown because of some cockamamie loan, them ended up underwater, they lost their homes, never able to get back into a home, they're not benefiting from that additional $34 billion that's back. Or if they weren't in the market when it was down around 650, now that it's 19,000, they're not benefiting. There's a lot of people we should be paying attention to that quite frankly, neither party paid enough attention to. And I know every time I talk about it, it's middle class Joe again. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of people got hurt. And many are still not back. While so many des workers deserve more pay for the work they do, household income is still up by 5.2 percent last year, $2,800 for the typical family. That's the fastest growth on record. And wages are scheduled to rise by about 3 percent this year alone. Our GDP is up 11 percent, even after accounting for inflation over the course of this administration. So there was undeniable progress over the past eight years. And the President and I both acknowledge not enough. Not enough. That's why we proposed a number of things I'll speak to in a moment. We're a lot better off today than we were then when we took office. I don't say this as a defense of the economy. I say this as a defense of why we should not be changing in a fundamental way some of the things that are being suggested. 
I often say the economy has gone from crisis to recovery, and we're now on the, on the cusp of resurgence. We also know the path to this resurgence is, is, uh, has included real hardships for Americans, some of whom have never really made it back. They still feel left out, and they have every reason to ask why. The first truth is the American economy cannot prosper in the midst of a financial crisis, period. Our capitalist system is the greatest allocator of capital in the history of the world. But when put toward protective uses, it helps create jobs and helps build the middle class. We need it, but we also need it to function in a fair way to let everybody in. So we could have allowed the entire financial sector to go bust and drive the country into an economic depression, or we could have intervened to save the economy and laid the groundwork to rebuild the middle class. The second truth is that more should have been done. Even on top of our trillion dollar stimulus for American families, even on top of the largest tax cut for middle class families in history, even on top of the lifeline to automakers, the president and I tried to do more. We pushed hard to pass the American Jobs Act of 2011 that provided billions in for training, unemployment insurance, tax cuts for small businesses. All told, the act would have, it was estimated, added 2 million jobs and generated an additional 1.5% in economic growth. But our friends in the Hill said no. We knew that in order to prosper, we needed a 21st century infrastructure. We rank 26th in the world, for example, in transportation infrastructure, the United States. Some of you may remember I got in a little trouble when I said if I blindfolded you and put you in LaGuardia and put you in the airport in Beijing, took your blindfold off at 2 in the morning and asked which was a developing country, you'd have said LaGuardia. <laughs> well, guess what? Everybody disagreed with me. They just got the governor, the mayor, the people of LaGuardia. Now there's a $6 billion program. This is the United States of America. We pushed for an infrastructure package that would have put millions of American workers back to work rebuilding America, but Republicans again said no. We proposed billions in tax cuts for working Americans, but again, the Hill said no. We want to make two years community college free, pay for it by closing the loopholes like stepped up basis. Republicans said no. Does anybody believe in the 21st century 12 years is enough? Does anybody really believe that to be true? That 12 years of free education is enough to compete in the 21st century? Already, that study I did for the president, six in 10 jobs right now require more than a college degree. I mean, excuse me, than a high school degree. We know so many other qualified women are staying out of the workforce, why? The cost of childcare. You live in Washington, you have two kids, it's $22,000 a year. We want to triple the maximum childcare tax credit. That, along with other publishers, could add 500,000 women into the workplace, increasing productivity and growth. Our friends said no. You know, when Reagan was president, we had about $800 billion in tax loopholes. Now we have $1.3 trillion per year. All the economists here at Georgetown, tell me you can justify more than 600 to 800 billion of that as generating either a social good or increased productivity. We want to reform the corporate tax code by incentivizing companies to bring their profits home and their operations back home. Our friends said no. In the end, we just didn't have the Republican votes in the Congress. So let me just say to you all that this, this is not your father's Republican Party. All of a sudden, I mean, I remember all the years I served in the Senate, infrastructure was pushed more by Republicans than by Democrats. Literally, not figuratively. There was a consensus on a whole range of things, like the basic bargain, that if you contributed to the well-being of the outfit you worked with, you got to share in the benefits. That was the basic bargain, Democrats and Republicans. From 1972, when I got elected as a 29-year-old kid, and 20 years before, 30 years before. Which leads to the fundamental question, where do we go from here? While the people have spoken, we can't be lulled in a sense of collective amnesia. And look, I happen to support the Electoral College, and again, I come from the state of Delaware. 
But two and a half million more people spoke for the other team than the team that got elected. We can't forget, though, what caused this god off recession of eight years ago. It was the same policies that are being proposed now. Have the rate on dividends. Cut the top income tax rate. Dramatically reduce, reduce the state tax. Deregulation orthodoxy. The president and I wanted to clear the rubble. Beyond that, we wanted to build a new stadium. We wanted to actually have lights in the stadium. But for God's sake, if we can't do that, let's at least make sure that the umpire is on the field calling balls and strikes and wearing a striped shirt. That's why we can't allow the repeal of Dodd-Frank. We can't go back to the days when the banks hired bank regulators. We can't go back to the days when the banks were free to take risks with your depositors' money. We can't go back to the days when financial companies take massive risks with the knowledge that taxpayer bailout is around the corner when they fail. We can't afford that. The country can't afford it. The middle class can't afford it. Another thing, we need to ensure that the executive compensation doesn't go back to encouraging executive risk-taking and short-termism. I've spoken at length about stock buybacks by publicly traded companies, how CEOs don't have the incentive to bill for the future, but rather swing for the fences today. They're not bad guys or bad women. The process incentivizes actions. That's the incentives. This all started in, 80, in, in 1980 when President Reagan's SEC, through Rule 10B-18, made it easier for companies to buy back stock to influence their share prices. We need to change this as well, in my view. We need to complete the remaining SEC rules created by Dodd-Frank, like limits on incentive-based compensation at financial companies. As Chairman Volcker said, we also need to continue to address the threats posed by a volatile short-term debt. And as evidenced by the recent concerns of retail banks, we need to step up our monitoring of enforcement activities. Look at Wells Fargo. Look at Wells Fargo. The Justice Department, I can't speak to it because I don't, I don't talk to them. The President, I can't talk to them. We're reviewing whether or not there's criminal sanctions here. But think of what other ordinary people go to jail for. But let's be clear. This should never be allowed to happen again. Millions of families pay the price for reckless and irresponsible policies. And our regulators need to have the resources to catch this activity before it gets out of control. It's pretty basic. You don't, like me, you don't have to be an economist to understand this. You don't have to be an economist. It helps. That's why I have some brilliant economists working for me. But you don't have to be an economist to understand this. Look at what caused the problem in the first place. Look at what we did to correct the problem. And ask now if it's worthy to change back to the problems that caused this in the first place. As my little grandson would say, it's not rocket science. Ladies and gentlemen, let me close with this. My deceased wife used to tell me, and she had a, her expression, she said, Joey, the greatest gift God made man, gave mankind was the ability to forget. And my mother, God love her, would immediately ask, she said, that's true, Joey. If that weren't true, every woman would only have one child. <laughs> but it is a great gift God gave us, the ability to forget. But how could you go on? But it doesn't apply in governing. Where to forget is dangerous, dangerous. Given what the people of this country went through eight years ago, on the cusp of a real depression, and how far we've come today on the cusp of a real potential resurgence, with the United States better positioned than any country in the world to lead the 21st century. My Lord, my Lord, we are so much better positioned. I'm not supposed to be an expert in the economy, but I'm supposed to be an expert in foreign policy. An expert's anywhere from out of town with a briefcase. I don't have my briefcase with me today. But I do know a lot about foreign policy. I've spent, I've met every major world leader in the last 35 years. 
and look around the world, do you think any leader of a major country would trade places with the President of the United States in terms of the opportunities of the 21st century? God loved China. I want to see them succeed. They not only don't have enough energy, they don't, they don't have enough water. They're talking about a $2 trillion project to turn the direction of the rivers around. Raise your hand if you think the EU is our serious competition and they're going to eat our lunch, as we were told. I remember Mr. Chairman being up at the Wharton School debating someone from, uh, from American Enterprise Institute how Japan was going to own us. Remember they were buying the Rockefeller Center and the rest? And I was viewed as heretical by saying there's not a shot in the world that happened. Why? Not because of Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Because we have the most agile venture capitalists in the world. We have the most productive workers in the world. There are three times the productive workers in Asia. Energy. We're the epicenter of energy for the remainder of this century, at least the next 50 years, including renewable energy. Watch what we can do. Watch what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, we respect intellectual property. You can adjudicate contract di differences and know they're going to be kept. We're so much better positioned than any nation in the world. And we have a workforce that continue to be replaced because, I might add, of the value of immigration. And name me a product that has transformed the world in terms of technology that wasn't made in America or conceived in America. The two great things about America, one of which is stamped in the DNA of every American, native born or otherwise, no matter what, how bad our education system is in grade school, no child ever gets criticized for challenging orthodoxy unlike any other country in the world, including our allies. We're encouraged to challenge orthodoxy. You can't make new things unless you break old things. We're a remarkable country. And we can't forget, we can't forget who we are or where we recently came from and go back to what created this crisis in the first place. We have to keep moving forward, and my hope and prayer is that we will. I think we have to give this administration, new administration, a fighting chance. I think they're in the position now of beginning to determine a lot of this stuff that seemed awful clear to them. It's not so clear. We'll see. We'll see what happens. If you notice, they decided they're going to immediately repeal the Affordable Care Act. Then all of a sudden, they figured out 20 million people will be off, no one have insurance. And then all of a sudden they figured out, holy mackerel, all those kids on your insurance policy, all you guys are on your parents' insurance policy. Good night. Good night, Lucy. <laughs> all of a sudden, they found out that they can go back to charge women more for insurance than men. All of a sudden they figured out, my Lord, pre-existing conditions, I guess, do matter. <laughs> now what are they talking about? We repeal immediately and we'll go into effect after the next election. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> Folks, look. Because there's so many young people in this audience, I want you to know two things. America has developed some incredible women and men who never, ever stop fighting for what they think is right for the country, like Paul Volcker. You've been a treasure, Mr. Chairman. I really mean it. No, no, you have been. There are voices that should be listened to based on their batting average. Take a look at what they said and what happened. Judge objectively whether or not it's worth listening to them. Measured against how fundamental things have changed and whether it's still relevant, whether it's still timely. But folks, this is no time to turn back. I got elected when I was a 29-year-old kid to the United States Senate. 
I was listed as the young idealist. I've been doing nothing but getting up in every morning, as my dad would say. It's a lucky person who puts two feet in the floor in the morning when they get up, knows what they're about to do, and thinks it still matters. I think it still matters a lot, a whole lot. And folks, just take a look. Take a look at where we are positioned to everyone else in the world. I was listed as the young optimist when I got elected. I'll conclude by saying I can say without fear of contradiction to anybody who knows me, I am truly more optimistic about America's chances today than any time I have been since I've served, and I've served for 44 years as either United States Senator or Vice President. We just got to let get some people out of the way. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.